From Washington, D.C. and around the world, this is Government Matters with Mimi Gerges. This is Government Matters, the only show covering the latest news trends and topics that matter to the business of government. I'm Mimi Gerges. Long COVID is defined as new, returning, or lingering sy symptoms after the initial infection. And given that the Veterans Health Administration is America's largest integrated healthcare system, the VA has launched several initiatives to study and treat the long-term effects of COVID-19 on vets. Dr. Carolyn Clancy is the Assistant Undersecretary for Health at the VA. Dr. Clancy, welcome to the program. Thank you, pleasure to be here. Uh, give me an overview of your role at the VA and what you're doing to help vets with COVID or with long COVID. I sometimes tell people I have the best job of all in VA healthcare because in our group is uh, VA's research program, which is unusual because it's a research program embedded in a care system, which reinforces and solidifies that we're, our research investments are intended to improve veteran outcomes. We also support an Office of Academic Affiliation. So you may not know that almost 70% of practicing U.S. doctors got some of their training in a VA facility. And every year, and it's not just doctors, it's nurses, it's psychologists, it's physical therapists, it's pharmacists, long, long list. Uh, so we have a big, big imprint on the future healthcare workforce. And every year, about 120,000 trainees are seeing patients in our system and learning how to become future health professionals. And the third part is VA uh, healthcare innovations. So these were the people who actually figured out how to use 3D printing to make uh, personal protective equipment. And we also have a group doing partnerships. Uh, they, for example, partnered with a Jewish group focused on food insecurity. So we were able to work with them to help veterans who had no access to food or lived alone or were isolated or whatever. So given um, the idea of long COVID being such a problem, not just for vets, but for ev everybody, give me an idea of the numbers that we're dealing with for in the veteran system. Sure, so um, about 615,000 veterans in our system have uh, gotten COVID. Um, that we know about, right? Some may have been tested elsewhere, but that's a rough ballpark. Um, our top researcher in St. Louis estimates that between four and 7% of veterans who've been infected have symptoms and a history consistent with long COVID. The definition is still being clarified of what that means, but persistent symptoms is clearly it. I'm understanding the World Health Organization is has a rough estimate of 10%, but I think we will learn more about that over time. But you're talking about a lot, a lot of people, and if you think about the millions of Americans who've had COVID, we're getting scary now. So what kind of research have you been doing for long COVID specifically? Well, first was looking at our electronic health record data to find out how many people had persistent symptoms. So how they were able to define this was to take a group of veterans who were infected with COVID COVID, find another group of veterans who looked exactly like the veterans in the COVID group, except that they didn't have COVID, and look at new diagnoses, new symptoms, uh, new reasons for coming in or seeking health care. And that excess uh, burden is what we are thinking about coming up with estimates of long COVID. Today, we do not yet have a clinical case definition, but that will come, I'm quite confident. I, and I don't mean we VA, I mean we, um, the global scientific community. You know, there was a question as to whether those who were initially hospitalized with COVID were more susceptible to developing symptoms of long COVID. Were you able to get an answer to that? Well, there's no question that severity matters a lot. So presumably people who were hospitalized had a more severe version of COVID, um, which could be a combination of viral load as well as their underlying conditions. But yes, they are more likely. But even very mild, possibly even asymptomatic infections don't make your risk zero. So as you're collecting data on, on long COVID, what are you actually doing with that and with the findings that you're able to collect? Well, first we are sharing it broadly with the scientific community. Um, 18 of our facilities, and it may be more now, we have about 146 uh, medical centers, um, are actually, have actually set up long COVID programs. And at least twice as many are trying to figure out 
it, will their approach work at our medical center? Uh, there's a very, very active uh, community of practice. Some have even arranged group visits for patients because I'm sure that we're all aware that in many ways patients are leading the way in calling our attention to this uh, writ large. Um, and we're trying to figure out how we can best uh, make sure that veterans know we're there for them, even if we don't have all the answers. We'll be able to tell them what we know and what we don't, and also to help them deal with the symptoms that they're having. So here's the question, which is all this great research going on at the VA, how can it be transferred and uh, helpful to the American public at large, to the non-vet population? Well, you know, I am beyond proud, and I have nothing to do with it except to uh, have the privilege of leading it now. Um, VA's research has had a huge impact on American health care. Um, a lot of work in mental health because this is a problem that veterans have, right? Um, the nicotine patch comes out of VA research, the first liver transplant. My personal favorite, if you or a relative has ever been a hospitalized patient and you've got the barcode on your wrist, right, that started in VA because a VA nurse who was getting chemotherapy sort of started wondering, how do I know that bag of poison is for me? And so VA was 20 to 25 years ahead of the rest of the U.S. healthcare system in terms of having that barcoding technology to double check. Dr. Clancy, uh, when we're talking about long COVID, what are the advantages that the VA brings to this type of research that really can't be done anywhere else? Well, we have had electronic records for about 25 years. Uh, so that means we've got uh, continuity with these veterans over time, and we have all of their records, whether that's outpatient, inpatient, uh, for those veterans who might be in a nursing home for a while, wherever they get care, we've got that information. So that helps a huge amount. Um, many of our researchers are actually doctors themselves, and they have appointments with our academic affiliates, so they might be a professor at the University of Minnesota or wherever, and they, too, um, are inspired by when they're caring for veterans. They'll say, wait a minute, we need to have find the answer to that. So there's this very uh, important flow between clinical care and the problems veterans are having and what we're funding in research. Um, what are the major challenges that you've been facing in studying long COVID? Um, I would say the major challenge is that we don't yet have a clear definition. I will also tell you on almost before we had a first case in VA or the US, we had planned a natural history study. Because even when we were first hearing about uh, COVID, uh, may have been before it was called uh, COVID, um, we were, scientists were speculating that we might see something like long, what we're now calling long COVID. So we are partnering with the Department of Defense to follow a group of people to see what happens to them over time when they are infected with this virus. Tell me a little bit more about that because I wanted to ask you about um, the other agencies, other departments within yes. the government that you are collaborating with. Yes, well clearly, you know, we have a very strong bond, if you will, with the Department of Defense because um, everyone who's in our system has served in the military, all of our patients. Um, so it's very logical and there's a lot of research that we do collaboratively with them, which I think is to the uh, benefit of active duty service members, their families, as well as the veterans we serve. Uh, but during COVID, we have all, during this pandemic, we have also worked very, very closely with the National Institutes of Health um, I'm sure many people have heard about Operation Warp Speed with the vaccine trials and rapid trials of new therapeutics. Um, our system brings a huge advantage to that. And the other advantage our system brings is many of the veterans we see actually think of participating in research as another way of giving back. It's really quite remarkable. And serving the country. Yes, and just based on a small pilot, we were able to identify about 55,000 veterans who raised their hands and said, I'd be willing to be contacted for a study, uh, which is just unbelievable. You don't see that elsewhere. The NIH is also studying long COVID though. Yes, so yes. how do you know you're not repeating the effort? Uh, how, how do you coordinate with them? Well, that's such a great question. First, we are coordinating with them very, very closely, in part because the administration has made this such a high priority and in part based on our experience over the past couple of years 
with close collaboration. Um, but there is not at this moment in time a clearly defined scientific community of people who are interested in long COVID. We're really hoping that that comes together over time. So will there be some redundant efforts? Probably. Now, redundant is only bad if you don't learn something from it, right? Um, but anything that we're funding from the federal government will have been reviewed and shared uh, the plans ahead of time with our other partner agencies and so forth. But I fully expect that other private foundations, uh, not-for-profit groups, and as I said, patients will be wanting to do this themselves. So I do think there is a big need to pull together um, all of the scientists who are very, very interested in this. Now, we talked about studying long COVID. Yes. What are you doing to care for patients that are suffering from long COVID? Um, the major uh, thing that we're doing is responding to the symptoms that they have. Based on our own data, we're worried about uh, cardiac symptoms, so we're keeping a very, very close eye on that. Uh, for many, many reasons that I think most people would be familiar with, we're also watching uh, mental health symptoms, uh, both uh, because of a direct effect of the virus, perhaps, but also the reaction to, my gosh, I thought I was done. What, what are you talking about, long COVID and so forth? And clearly that's had a huge impact on many people who are having persistent symptoms. Now let's talk about the budget. How big is the budget overall um, for the VHA and how much is assigned for the study and care for long COVID? So the research budget is about $882 million. Um, and many of our researchers get funding from other agencies, NIH, uh, Department of Defense, and foundations and so forth. Um, our money goes a lot further though, because many of the, when you are um, supporting a grant, you're often paying for people's time. And many of the clinicians who are conducting studies for us are actually paid on, as they're in their roles as uh, physicians. So more, little money goes a much further way for uh, VA. We have $25 million earmarked for long COVID, but that's right now. Um, we're also looking at, as our operational partners are trying to figure out how do they make sure that every facility is prepared for this, it, embedding researchers with them so that we can collect information in a very, very consistent way across our system. How do you think COVID-19 and long COVID will change American health care in general? Oh, a fabulous question. Uh, first of all, as all of us know, when we went into lockdown a little over two years ago, everything about daily life changed like a light switch. And healthcare is no different, right? So people who actually didn't even do phone calls very often with patients, I'm thinking uh, clinicians, suddenly were on Zoom or whatever platform they were using. VA had a really big advantage there because we've been supporting telehealth and investing in it since about 2003. Um, I don't see, some patients are gonna wanna come back and be face to face with their clinicians and that's wonderful. But many will say, you know, I'm done with looking for a parking spot or figuring out how to get to the facility. I like this, it works. It's not for every aspect of care, but for primary care, mental health, um, we, when you're not having a procedure, it works like a charm. But I think it's an open question how many of those adaptations that we had to make rapidly become part of the new normal. Um, to the extent that it makes um, getting care and getting a response when they have needs for veterans, I'm hoping it's more rather than less. But that is kind of a million dollar question right now in terms of uh, the future of healthcare. Um, I'm hoping that we learn a lot and have learned a lot from the experience of patients with HIV and other diseases that collaborating and partnering with patients with long COVID I think will be a very, very important part of the journey moving forward. All right. Well, Dr. Clancy, thank you so much for being on the program. A pleasure. Thank you for having me. Thanks for watching. If you enjoyed the video, give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on any future Government Matters interviews.